Good morning, and it's Scott, nice to be on this panel with you again. Dr. Stone, thank you for your kind invitation to tell our audience about the lessons that we have learned from the first decade of MR ultrasound fusion biopsy at UCLA. These high-tech biopsies are entering the mainstream of our specialty. So it's important to know the advantages and the concerns about the new method. MR-guided biopsy can be done directly within the MRI tube by a radiologist, as shown here. It can be done by the urologist using cognitive targeting or vi visual targeting, getting a, a bead on where you think the lesion is and then going to that place on ultrasound. And it can also be done using a fusion device, using an apparatus that includes a software for bringing together the ultrasound and the MRI. And it is that uh, modality that I will be addressing this morning. The two devices most commonly in use in the United States are the Artemis device from the uh, Eigen company and the Euronav device from Philips Electronics. Fusion biopsy started in approximately 2009. And a few months ago, the <coughs> AUA endorsed use of the new method whenever quality MRI is available, uh, either for first time or repeat biopsies. Uh, the first clause here is very important when quality MRI is available. Uh, we're gonna return to that uh, in uh, just a few minutes. That is a very important part of this talk. So the first FDA approval of a fusion device was in April of 2008. That device was then unveiled at the AUA meeting in Orlando, Florida in May of 2008. And in this corner of this giant convention center in the smallest possible booth was the first showing of an image fusion device. That was the Artemis device. Um, I happened on it by chance. Uh, a year later, the Euronav was also approved by the US FDA, and the game was on from that point. How I long to go to another AUA meeting, one of these days. Fusion biopsy combines stored MRI images like this one, including the lesion, which is contoured by the radiologist, with real-time ultrasound performed by the urologist, bringing in the lesion uh, shown here on the MRI and creating a 3D reconstructed model of the prostate as shown here in the fusion device. Biopsy can then be aimed specifically at regions of interest, seen here, ROIs, regions of interest, and systematic biopsies can also be performed using a built-in template that's incorporated in the fusion devices. And the biopsy site locations uh, are then stored for possible recall and future use as may be necessary. It brings the accuracy of MRI into an office setting. We got our first unit in uh, on March 23rd of 2009. Uh, I, I admit I didn't really know much about it or what I was doing, but I thought the idea was very interesting. At first it was just me and the technician from the company. But quickly I realized uh, that to get the most out of this new device and to, especially to advance uh, the knowledge base in, behind it, that I would need more expertise just in me and the technician. So shortly after we got it, we assembled a team, uh, a team of multi disciplines to help bring this uh, new technology to fruition. It included a pathologist, Jati Wong, who looked at each core separately so we could track it back to where it came from in the prostate a urologist, and I've been the operator, a biomedical engineer, Sean Natarajan, who made this his PhD thesis work and is now a, is a, an acknowledged expert on image fusion. 
a research coordinator, uh, and a radiologist, Dan Margolin, who became uh, very knowledgeable about MRI as one of the world's great MRI readers. Um, and uh, we began using this new technology at that time uh, for first time biopsies, for men who had had prior negative biopsies, but remained cancer suspects. We used it for men in active surveillance. And we also most recently have been using it to select and follow men undergoing various forms of focal therapy. All of these people in this picture have now moved on to better jobs, except me. I'm still here and I'm happy to be telling you about what we're doing. It's really grown like Topsy. It's been a, a wonderful adventure. The key part of a fusion bi uh, biopsy program is truly quality MRI and how MRI has changed from the early days. This is the first ever published image of a prostate MRI uh, done by Dr. Reddy Ricek. Um, and uh, about all you can see in this T1, T1 image using a 0.35 magnet was the Foley catheter inside the patient and how we have progressed. Um, this is a contemporary multi-parametric MRI showing a T2, T2 uh, aspect here with a lesion apparent right here. This is for spatial orientation. The diffusion weighted imaging conferring, uh, confirming the T2 right here. You can see this. The contrast study, uh, dynamic contrast enhancement shows the lesion again. And when the prostate is removed, nice to see that the whole mount correlation with the MRI is, uh, is very uh, similar uh, and allows us a good, good uh, correlation. This is very comforting when we see this. The biopsies as we do them are in a clinic setting under local anesthesia. We uh, have used the Artemis device from the beginning. Uh, the uh, biopsies are done under local anesthesia only, no sedation. We do one uh, about every 45 minutes in our clinic, 15 minutes for the procedure and about half an hour for the turno turnover. So we're devoting three half days a week, doing five a day uh, per half day. And we've done doing about uh, 15 a week and that's our current uh, workload. The two institutions in the United States with the most experience in, the, uh, in these, this work are the group at NCI headed by Peter Pinto using the neuro, NeuroNav device, which is, uses an electromagnetic tracker. And our work at UCLA, we've done about the same number using the Artemis device, which uses a GPS system built into the angles of the uh, robotic arm here. It's a, 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 another method of tracking, but the results of these two methods are very similar. We're actually publishing uh, together with them in the near future. Other devices used uh, in the United States include the Coelis device, which is made in France. In Germany, there's a Biopsy device, which is popular there. And very recently, the BK company, ultrasound company, has also introduced a fusion device. But it's um, comforting to know that the results are pretty similar across the different platforms. If you're new to this game, and we want to get into it. The first step is to bring your radiologist on board, bringing them up to speed because reading prostate MRIs is very tricky. Uh, they're going to have to get experience somehow. We have a program here for, uh, for uh, certifying them, but there is really no formal certification process, even in the radiology society. So, so it's very tricky and the radiologist has to be experienced and you, you'll have to work with him and get to know his abilities. Um, the, uh, you'll have to get your own machine or get a mobile unit to bring it in to develop your image fusion procedure. The pathologist has got to be involved because he's an important part of this. Uh, each core that we obtain is submitted separately uh, so that we can track it back to just where it came from. And then you're ready to offer this to patients in your community and it will be a very welcome addition to the community. So what lessons have we learned? Over that first decade, we've done around 4,000 of these. And I've picked out the five most important lessons that we've learned to pass on to you. They include the value of targeted sampling of MRI visible lesions, the importance of systematic sampling using a template, the tracking of prior 
positive biopsy sites. The knowledge that MRI visible lesions do not necessarily indicate exactly what the pathology is. And for the prediction of final pathology, you can have better security, better comfort in what the uh, fusion biopsy shows than in a conventional ultrasound guided biopsy. So let me address each one of these briefly. Um, targeting is dependent upon the PIRADS score that's assigned. Um, these, uh, this is a PIRADS version of uh, grade three, which has about a 24% chance of having a clinically significant cancer when you target that. A PIRADS four lesion, which is larger and darker than a PIRADS three, 37% chance of finding a, a cancer in there and a PIRADS-5 lesion, which is still larger and darker, yet uh, where most of these are clinically significant prostate cancers. So, so we uh, are, want to emphasize the importance of the PIRADS score. It's something you need to be aware of. You don't have to be too worried about uh, how this score is obtained because it's quite technical, but you do need to be aware of these scores targeted uh, biopsy. In this example, in a man with a PIRADS-5 lesion, this is the throw of the biopsy core. In this case, the MRI visible lesion, which is outlined in red here, happens to superimpose upon an MR, uh, uh, ultrasonically visible hypoechoic focus. Would were this the case, but it's not always the case. It's usually not the case. So we target what we see on the MRI. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough to find a hypoechoic lesion there, then we can uh, follow that along as well. The, um, the green dots represent the template, the spatial template built into the tracking, uh, into the uh, uh, fusion device, very helpful for, for uh, spatial sampling of the prostate. We always follow that. The second lesson that we've learned after targeting is the importance of systematic sampling. We accomplish this by following the template, which I showed on the previous slide. Uh, this is always performed at the first biopsy session where we both do targeting here of visible lesions and systematic sampling of the rest of the prostate. Because while targeting is the most important, there are a number of tumors which are MRI invisible, perhaps 20% or more, uh, not MRI visible. And so they can't be targeted, but often they can, they can be detected on systematic biopsy. Therefore, if a biopsy is clinically indicated, that is a PSA abnormality, uh, especially PSA density, or if something is palpable, abnormal, or if there's a strong family history, we're gonna do the biopsy even if the MRI is negative. And we do a full systematic sampling by following the template. The other lesson we've learned is the value of tracking. Uh, that is, uh, uh, this is seldom emphasized in, in uh, reports, but it is extremely important. For example, in this biopsy here, this initial biopsy, there's a target here. We do targeted sampling. We do systematic sampling. We find a little Gleason 3 plus 3 spot here in a systematic sample and another Gleason 3 plus 3 spot in the target. One year later, we go back to this uh, uh, situation, we do an overlay of the new uh, MR, uh, the new of the new uh, ultrasonic uh, tracker, and we uh, we go back and we rebiopsy this prior positive spots right up here, and also right down here. We find no cancer here when we go back, but in this uh, tracked area down here, what do you know? It's a Gleason four plus three, and the man needs some kind of treatment. So. Um, we, uh, we do both, uh, we have, have found tracking to be extremely helpful in detecting upgrades. Um, we uh, use tracking, especially in active surveillance, and, if, uh, uh, and, and most of the upgrades found in our active surveillance programs are uh, found on tracking biopsies. We've published two times on this, and if you want to learn about this, these are uh, currently available. Uh, recent literature. The fourth lesson is that the MRI lesion visible is not always tantamount to the actual pathology. Uh, for example, in this, look at the middle 
lesion here, you can see the uh, green is the MRI visible lesion, two of these, and the red is what's actually there in the, when we take out the prostate. These are two different views, a transverse and a sagittal view. And you can see that sometimes it's pretty close and sometimes it's quite far off. The on average in the actual tissue, the prostate cancer is about 11 millimeters longer with three times the volume of the MRI visible lesion. So the MRI visible lesion is only an indicator of where it is, what it might be, but it doesn't equal the actual uh, pathologic finding. The final uh, lesson that we have learned is that uh, the upgrading rate from MR guided biopsy to radical prostatectomy is very low. In other words, what you see is what you actually have, uh, what you see on, on uh, MR guided biopsy is a very close approximation of what's going to be in the radical prostatectomy specimen using um, conventional ultrasound guided biopsies, this number is closer to 40 or 50 percent. So we, we uh, have great confidence in what we're finding on these, on these biopsies. Well, as a result, the growth of MRI guided biopsy has been very great in the United States and in Europe, uh, even more so in England, both in private patients, in this stuff, uh, this report from Emory, and in Medicare patients, you can see that the, the upswing in the past few years is tremendous. We now think that probably a quarter or more of all biopsies being done in the United States are uh, MR guided. That number is sure to grow. Now, I was asked to speak about the advantages of the transrectal approach compared to the uh, transperineal approach. Um, we are interested in the transperineal biopsies, but and for certain patients. But we've been reluctant to jump on that bandwagon in a uh, uh, wholehearted way yet, um, for three reasons. Sepsis, which is the primary reason to do transperineal biopsies, can be prevented. Uh, our own experience is a testament to that. We consulted our anti-biogram, which is a compilation of all cultures and sensitivities done at our institution over the past year and found that a drug, one drug offered us a good chance of preventing sepsis. For us, it's ertapenem, and we are giving a single IM injection of ertapenem an hour before the procedure. And in the last 1500 biopsies, about three years worth, we have not had a single septic episode. So we have prevented sepsis and continue to use transrectal biopsy routinely. The other reason to do this is because patients prefer the, the lateral decubitus position or versus the dorsal uh, lithotomy position, which is required for transperineal biopsy. That reduces patient's anxiety, reduces the need for sedation and for anesthesia. anesthesia. So patient comfort is another reason to do this. And the third reason that we have continued using the transrectal approach routinely is that the uh, fusion systems for transrectal biopsy are mature and proven. Whereas for transperineal biopsy, they are still rather young and unproven. Uh, perhaps they will get better with time. I'm sure they will. But for the time being, we uh, are happy with our work during transrectal, although we are using uh, transperineal in selected cases. I couldn't help but notice this uh, article in just uh, last month's Journal of Urology uh, uh, showing about the pain level with uh, perineal biopsies. I'm sure Dr. Gorin will want to comment on this, but there is an appreciable amount of pain with this, much more so than with uh, transrectal biopsies. These were the risk factors these authors identified, uh, so perhaps these can be addressed and can be uh, relieved uh, in the future. Again, our lessons, important, important to target MRI visible lesions, but they're not all visible. Therefore, important to also do systematic sampling at least once using a template on every patient. Please remember the tracking of prior biopsy sites is important. And what you see on the MRI is only an indication of where the lesion is, uh, but does not really co correlate very well with the exact dimensions of it. 
And when you do an MRI guided biopsy and it comes back, uh, the results can be, uh, are very comforting, either positive or negative, and they can uh, help, help you predict what's actually in the prostate to go from there. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I will now be happy to turn this program over to my colleague, Dr. Mike Gorin.